Hello friends, uh, welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on soil and water conservation engineering. I am Rajendra Singh, Professor in Agriculture and Food Engineering Department, IIT Kharagpur. We are in week 6, uh, lecture 28 and the topic today is design considerations of permanent gully control structures. Just to have a look at the course content of this week, we started this week uh, lecture 26 by introducing gully control measures. In lecture 27, we continued with gully control measures, but focus was on permanent structures. Today, lecture 28, we will talk about design considerations for permanent gully control structures and next two lectures that is lectures 29 and 30 will focus on basics of open channel hydraulics in two parts, part 1 and part 2. Uh, just to have a quick uh, recap, uh, we started uh, we, in the previous lecture we discussed about the permanent gully control structures and we saw that there are three basic types of permanent gully control structures, drop spillway, drop inlet spillway and shoot spillway and we saw various components and uh, what are the advantages, disadvantages, what are their adaptabilities. We also saw the, uh, their intercomparison in a previous lecture and we will go into design considerations uh, today. And uh, we also uh, have a quick look at the purpose of designing these gully control structures. We already know that uh, the main function of these gully control structures is of course, gully stabilization and soil erosion control. And the third major could be of course, water conservation because when water is retained in between the structures, uh, then obviously it is, uh, it, is uh, uh, infiltr it infiltrates into the soil. And of course, beyond that uh, they can be also used for sediment control, flood control or for drainage. So, these are the various purposes for which uh, these uh, uh, permanent gully control structures could be uh, adopted or these are designed for. Now, as far as uh, planning for design is concerned, the permanent structures are constructed when the benefits from such structures are justifiable compared to cost of construction because we know that, uh, uh, that typically either concrete or machinery or uh, uh, reinforced concrete is used for cost for constructing these uh, structures. So, obviously, the cost is a major component. So, the while planning we have to be sure that the benefits we derived out of these structures must be justified with respect to the cost which we are going to incur. Then these structures must be designed after careful investigation of various factors influencing the characteristics of approaching the structure with reference to specific site conditions. So, obviously, because uh, these are all structures which are uh, likely to handle uh, large quantity of uh, flow, be it uh, peak runoff rate or be it uh, runoff volume. So, obviously, all the factors that could influence the runoff, especially for a particular site that has to be taken into account. We should also take into account the downstream flow characteristics that is we are providing the structure, whether the downstream channel has sufficient capacity to take that flow or not or any other related characteristics we have to study and of course, any other specific requirements and all these precautions we are taking because uh, these are all uh, these structures have a, a longer lifespan and the cost of construction is quite high and uh, also uh, in case they fail then the damages could be much larger. The design should also include an analysis of all the factors affecting the work which is quite obvious. And another important thing which we have to keep in mind that there are no standard solutions which can be applied to all the problems encountered in the field. So, that means uh, case by case whenever a problem encounters the field conditions when we are going to uh, we are planning for designing any of these structures that has to be handled. There is no ready made package uh, of practices that can be adopted for while designing or um, planning these structures. Now, coming to design considerations for gully control structures, 
the structures must have sufficient provision for safe discharge. So, obviously, because uh, uh, in the previous class we, I mentioned that typically these structures the return period T uh, uh, or I must write also return period or recurrence interval T is generally 50 to uh, 100 years uh, or rather uh, not, not, not really it is 25 to 50 years for these structures. So, these structures are designed for a recurrence interval of 25 to 50 years that means they are likely to handle a uh, huge flow and that is why they should have sufficient provision to handle such discharge. The structure should have sufficient strength to withstand the pressure exerted by flowing water. So, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, the not only the it should have the capacity to handle the flow, but at the same, same time it should be strong enough to handle or rather to withstand the pressure that might be exerted by flowing water. And the structure should be protected from erosion due to the flow passing over it. So, obviously, when the flow passes, uh, with such a huge flow passes through, uh, passes through or over the structures that might also cause erosion and that is why uh, there should be enough protection provided against erosion when flow is taking place over these structures. So, all these three important points refer to hydrologic, hydraulic and structural features of these structures. So, because uh, uh, when we talk about the safe discharge then obviously, the hydrolo hydrology comes when we say that there should be sufficient provision then hydraulics comes and we say that that structure should be sufficient should have sufficient strength then structural feature comes. So, we are basically design consideration we are referring about the hydrologic, hydraulic and structural features of these structures and that is why typically uh, the design procedure of these structures is divided into three phases, three different phases and these are hydrologic design, hydraulic design and structural design. So, there are three types of designs involved in a single structure hydrologic design, hydraulic design and structural design and what are these meant for and how they are done we will have a look in next slides. Let us start with the hydrologic design. Hydrologic designs deals with the determination of peak runoff rate and flood volume which the structure is expected to handle. So, basically when we say we are going for hydrologic design of a structure then basically that focuses on determining the peak flow it could be rate runoff rate or it could be volume with either peak volume of runoff or peak rate of runoff either of that that we have to find out or we have to determine uh, and the structure has to handle this particular flow. So, structure has to be designed to handle the flow that is determined under hydrologic design. So, that is the importance of hydrologic design that here we determine the flow magnitude which the structure is likely to handle and that is the first information starting with which we design the structure. And the prediction of peak runoff rates and flood volumes includes the study of the factors influencing the runoff that is characteristic of rainfall and the watershed which is quite obvious that uh, because we want to predict uh, peak runoff rate and flood volumes then obviously, uh, we have to always consider all the factors that influence the runoff for example, the rainfall which is the main input and of course, the watershed characteristics that um, may absorb a significant of water or may not absorb. So, depending upon uh, the characteristics of rainfall and characteristics of the watershed the flow characteristics will be um, different from different area or different watersheds and that is why we have to take care of these. And these structures are designed to handle runoff from the heaviest rains that may be expected once in 25 to 50 years or more depending upon the estimated life of the structure. So, this is what I was referring about the T recurrence interval or return period that 
uh, while designing these structures or while determining the peak runoff rate or flood volume, uh, we take into account uh, uh, recurrence interval of the runoff or rainfall event that is likely to occur once in 25 years. That is, uh, rec recurrence interval of 25 to 50 years is considered. That means that that particular event is likely to occur once in 20 to 5 to 50 years and whether it is 25 or 50 that depends on the estimated life of the structure. And the, for the design of a spillway for flood protection structures like drop inlet spillway, information on total volume of runoff and inflow outflow and reservoir stage and storage characteristics are important. So, this is a very typical uh, design requirement that is related to drop inlet spillway. The drop inlet spillway wherever they are used uh, as a uh, as a integral part of a reservoir then obviously, uh, besides total volume of runoff the inflow outflow and reservoir stage and storage characteristics also play an important role that how much water will be released from the reservoir that is basically governed by inflow outflow and reservoir stage and storage characteristics of reservoir. So, these information have also to be taken into account while designing drop inlet spillway. So, important thing is then in the hydrologic design we decide the peak runoff rate or peak runoff volume for analyzing that or finding that or determining that we consider rainfall heaviest rainfall of uh, uh, recurrence interval 25 to 50 years uh, uh, year and this is a special requirement for drop inlet spillway. Then uh, uh, there is something called hydrological design scale and it is defined as the range in magnitude of the design variable from which a value must be selected. So, it is basically a scale, it is a range uh, of a particular variable may be runoff from which a value has to be selected. And design considerations of course, include safety and cost. These are two important things on one side there is a safety and the other side there is a cost and of course, under all circumstances there has to be a balance between safety and cost of the structure. So, for example, if you are designing a small structure they should not be designed for large peak flow because they may be uh, safe, but they may not be cost effective. On the other hand, if we are designing a large structure, then it should not be designed for small peak value because it may be completely unsafe. So, that is why we have to always while designing a structure, we have to keep a balance between the safety and cost. We have to be always careful, be careful about that. Then there is something called ELV estimated limiting value and the lower limit on design value is 0 and upper limit on design value is ELV. And so, ELV is the largest magnitude possible for a hydrologic event at a given location based on best available hydrological information analysis that is length of record, reliability of information, accuracy of analysis. So, uh, ELB is the largest magnitude possible for a hard, hydrological event. And uh, uh, while this uh, doing this, we may also have a look at the probable maximum precipitation which is referred as PMP or probable maximum flood PMF, um, uh, the data which are also available uh, or they can be created um, based on if you have large amount of data available of the uh, rain gauges or the uh, flood gauging sites in the vicinity of the area. The hydrologic design extreme events like floods and droughts may be identified for designing structures having longer life expectancy and we always know that magnitude of extreme events is related to frequency of occurrence. So, magnitude is inversely proportional to frequency of occurrence. So, if frequency is high magnitude is lower, frequency is low magnitude will be higher. And the frequency analysis typically is employed for doing all this analysis. So, let us look into some basics of frequency analysis. So, frequency analysis deals with the chance of occurrence of an event equal to or greater than a specified magnitude that is the definition of uh, frequency analysis. The objective of frequency analysis of hydrologic data 
is to relate the magnitude of extreme events to their frequency of occurrence through use of probability distribution functions. So, basically we use probability distribution functions so that the frequency of occurrence of an event and its magnitude may be related. And for carrying out this frequency analysis, it is assumed that the hydrologic data are independent and identically distributed and hydrologic system producing them is considered to be stochastic, space independent and time independent. So, entire analysis that simply means is space independent and time independent and uh, stochastic uh, that is uh, there is chance of occurrence is always there, the probability is always there. So, continuing with this, uh, suppose P is the probability of occurrence of an event X which could be rainfall or any other hydrological variable whose magnitude is equal to or in excess of a specific magnitude x t. So, p p is the probability of x which is the event we are talking about is greater than or equal to x t which is a specified magnitude. And the recurrence interval return period is related to p probability is t equals to 1 by p that is uh, recurrence interval is inversely proportional to probability. And the recurrence interval or return period represents the average interval between the occurrence of a rainfall of magnitude equal to or greater than x t. So, that is the average interval between the occurrence of a rainfall of magnitude equal to or greater than x t. That means, what is the average interval between a particular magnitude of same uh, event of same magnitude will occur that is the uh, recurrence interval or return period. That means, if we say return period is 50 years, then it is likely that an event will occur will, uh, will reoccur after 50 years or once in 50 years rather. So, if the return period of a rainfall of 20 centimeters is 24 hours in 10 years at a certain period, it implies that on an average rainfall magnitude equal to or greater than 20 centimeters in 24 hour occur once in 10 year period. That simply means that in a long period of 100 years, 10 such events can be expected. So, that is the meaning of recurrence interval. So, if you say recurrence interval is 10 years, then over 100 years 10 such events may occur. However, it does not mean that such rainfall events will be separated by 10 years. That is periodicity is not guaranteed. It does not mean that uh, if an event occurred in 2000, then it will occur in 2010, 2020 and so on. And it is much more likely that two or more such events may occur within one year or even few months. So, that is possibility, but over a long period of time uh, they will be occurring um, as per their return period. And uh, as far as frequency analysis methods are concerned, there are two methods of performing frequency analysis, empirical or graphical method and the other is frequency factor matter, empirical or uh, frequency factor method. The empirical method, the accidents probability of the event is obtained by the use of empirical formula known as plotting position formula and there are several plotting position of formula that has been developed over the period of time. So, empirical method we use plotting position formula and just to have a look at some of the plotting position formulae. Uh, five are listed here, California, Hazen, Ribble, Chegodev, Blom and here the probability is for say Ribble distribution it is given by m by n plus 1, where m is the rank assigned to the data after arranging them in descending order of the magnitude. Thus, the maximum value is assigned m equal to 1, the second largest value m equal to 2 and the lowest value will be m equal to n, n being the number of records. So, first we arrange the data n in descending order of magnitude and then the, we rank them to get the value of m and n is al already defined as the number of records in the data series. So, once m and n are known, we can find out the probability of each of the data point in the series. And we will formula is the most commonly used plotting position formula which is adopted. Now, once we have calculated p or t because t is equal to 1 by p. So, in the formula we can we have written p equals to 
m by n plus 1 we can also write t equals to n plus 1 by m it is a similar thing. So, having calculated p or t for all the events in the series the variation of rainfall magnitude is plotted against the corresponding t on semi log or log log paper. So, here you have a rain, rainfall for example, if you are talking about the rainfall the magnitude and the return period. So, we have uh, n data points. So, for each of them we have calculated return period. So, we will draw uh, a uh, we will plot them in uh, a semi log or log log paper this is a semi log paper we are seeing. And rainfall magnitude for any recurrence interval can be determined by interpolating or extrapolating the plot between magnitude and recurrence interval. So, once we have plotted this and say for example, we want this is 10. So, this is 20. So, if you want the rainfall magnitude for 20 years return period. So, we can use this graph to get the value of rainfall magnitude or we can interpolate. We can also extrapolate to certain level. So, extrapolate means we have to extend this curve little bit on this side. So, for say for 30 years if you want then we can extrapolate and get the value. But uh, for more accurate results uh, empirical procedures can give good results for small extrapolations, but the errors increase with the amount of extrapolation. So, if we extrapolate uh, to a large level then obviously, there will be lot of error in the uh, estimation uh, in our estimation. So, that is why for more accurate results analytical methods using frequency factor are used. So, probability distribution function uh, I mean this uh, empirical method is very simple we use plotting position formula to for any given series to get p for each data point or t corresponding t and then we plot the magnitude versus return period and we draw a smooth curve straight line relationship we obtain and then we can interpolate or extrapolate for given uh, t value. Or if you want more accurate results we use integral method using frequency factor. Uh, before going to frequency factor I must also mention that there are some standard probability papers that is we do not need to plot the data on a log log or semi log paper, but there are standard probability papers also. So, if you feel that your data follows normal distribution. So, we can use straight away normal distribution uh, probability paper where x is plotted against the probability of non accident or probability of accidents and then we can get the uh, read the values directly from here. Similarly, for all other distributions uh, the graphs are available uh, standard graphs or charts are available. Uh, this one is for Gumbel extreme value type 1 distribution uh, it is a probability paper. So, for different return period and magnitude you can plot the curve and then can interpolate or extrapolate as the requirement may be. If we come talk about the frequency factor method then uh, obviously, it is based on general equation of hydrological frequency analysis and the equation was given by Chow in 1951 and 1954 and as per this equation x t is equal to x bar plus k sigma. This is a simple equation, but very important. Uh, so, you should try to remember this x t equals to x bar plus k sigma where x t is the value of the variate x with return period t. So, this is the thing which we want to find out this is the unknown x bar and uh, sigma they come from the data series. So, x bar is the mean of the variate and sigma is the standard deviation of the variate. So, once we have the data series we first uh, do simple statistical analysis and find out mean and standard deviation. So, x bar and k sigma uh, are already known to us. Then only a known left is k which is referred to as frequency factor which depends on the return period and probability density function of x. So, it k is a function of prob return period we are talking about or we are interested in and the probability density function of x. The, so, what probability distribution function our data follows that we should know in order to be able to get the value of k or frequency factor. So, so that once k is known then we can find the value of x t from this equation. So, for an assumed distribution a relation between k and t can be derived uh, for normal distribution k is simply given k is equal to z where z is referred to as standard normal variate we will see its definition little later. For log normal distribution value of k can be calculated from here where data is transformed. 
the x is our uh, observed data we transfer and logarithmically we transfer to y and then we can find out the standard deviation and mean and then can find out the value of k y basically. So, k y here and then we can find the value of k. So, this is how uh, it can be calculated straight away from uh, this equation. Then uh, if you talk about the normal distribution, uh, we know that this is a Gaussian distribution symmetrical bell shaped probability density function, two parameters, it is a two parameter distribution, it has mean and standard deviations as parameters and the function is given by this relationship in terms of x, it is also expressed in terms of z where z is x minus mu by sigma. So, x is our variate and mu and sigma are mean and standard deviation which we can calculate from the data series and then z can for corresponding to each of the data points we can calculate the value of z and this z is referred to as standard normal variate and for normal distribution k equals to z we already saw. So, that means once we obtain the z the, the value of k is also obtained for a normal distribution. The standard normal variate z has 0 mean and unit variance and for different probability distributions like normal, log normal, Pearson type 3 or extreme value standard tables are also available for obtaining k value for different t. So, we have formulas, we have tables, so straight away these k values can be obtained and as we have seen that x t equals to x bar plus k sigma. So, k is x bar and sigma we are obtaining from uh, from the data points itself, data series itself. This is the k which is unknown. So, once we decide or we find out that our data follows log normal distribution. So, I can and, and the, if the value of t is predetermined or decided then for log normal and t either I can calculate the value I, or I can refer the value from standard table. So, this is how it works. So, let us say take a simple example. The following data presents a peak discharge of a river for 37 years. Compute the 100 year peak flow assuming that data follows normal distribution. So, we are assuming that the data is following normal distributions and these are the data which are available with us. So, of course, as I have already mentioned that we have to first calculate the mean and standard deviation of the data series. So, we are calculating here. Now, in our case value of t is given as 100, we have to find out the value of k basically, uh, k is a function of two things t and p d f that is probability distribution function and here in this case we are already decided that it is normal. So, we have to find the value of k and in effect we have to find the value of z basically for given t. So, T capital T is 100 years. So, probability of accidents is 1 by 100 or 0 0.01. So, probability of an event less than 100 years event or non accidents is 0 0.99 and from a standard normal curve which is cumulative normal table the z value can be read as 2.33 and this we can see here. So, this is a cumulative normal table we have found out 0.99. So, this is the value we have to read and the value is z value is 2, it is x written, but it is z 2.30, 2.31, 2.32, 2.33. So, this is 2.33 basically the column corresponding to 2.33 where this value is here. So, we get the value of z uh, 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 2.33. And so, once uh, we get the value of z or k, then knowing x bar and sigma, we can calculate x t which comes out to be 1607.04 cumic um, for the given data series. Then we come to the hydraulic design which deals with the determination of dimensions of the structure which can handle the estimated peak runoff through drop and shoot spillway and design outflow and storage capacity in case of drop inlet spillway. So, basically once we do frequency analysis and we get the flow value then we go for hydraulic design. So, once uh, flow is known then dimensions of the structure we calculate. 
It also involves the study of effect of flow on upstream and downstream reaches of the channel and dissipation of kinetic energy liberated by drop in the water surface elevation. So, these are also aspect which has to be considered while uh, considering the hydraulic design of a structure. Then comes the structural design and the structural design provides the required strength and stability to the component parts of the structure. So, the sizes we have sizes of the different parts we have calculated under hydraulic design. Now, under structural design we have to see that these structures uh, these component parts are provided strength and stability to handle the pressure. It involves the analysis of various forces acting on the structure that is the water pressure static and dynamic which acts on the structure. The force is developed due to overflow over the structure and also the effect of water flow underneath the structure that is seepage subsurface flow. So, all kinds of hydrostatic uh, pressures or forces that have to be taken into account. And the structure must be stable under the action of the external forces and should be able to withstand the sliding forces yielding from its own weight. So, uh, I mean all the hydrostatic pressure and the uh, sliding and it should be safe against sliding, safe against overturning all these aspects has to be considered while uh, carrying out the structural design. Uh, then uh, um, last thing we should also uh, have a look at the causes of failure. The structure of failure is caused mainly due to faulty hydraulic, hydrologic, hydraulic or structural design either alone or a combination of these. So, basically uh, if we are true with the hydrologic design, hydraulic design, structural design, there is no chance of failure. Only if we fail to correctly handle any of these, then only the failure occurs. And structure may fail because insufficient capacity of the structure has been provided. That means, we have not been able to do our hydrological uh, design properly. Insufficient provision for dissipation of kinetic energy within the confinement structure. That means, while doing our hydraulic uh, design, we have not been true. Unprotected banks near the upstream of a structure, this is also a part of hydraulic design and improper foundation causing uplift pressure to prevail over the body of the structure. So, that is structural design. So, if we are true or if we do our hydrologic, hydraulic and structural design carefully and correctly, then there is no chance of failure of any of these structures. So, these are some of the design considerations we had a look today. And uh, of course, when as I mentioned that we will take the detailed design of each of these structures and when we take that then of course, we will refer to these points back at that point of time. Thank you very much.